the presentation? All right. Yes. Great. Let me get my uh, cursor set up here. All right. Yeah. So uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation and and for the introduction. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'll I'll be talking about uh, using multi-layer graphene as the uh, working medium for an endoreversible auto engine. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is. Well, why are we interested in looking at engines and in particular quantum engines in, in the first place? So if we kind of think back to uh, the, the origins of thermodynamics, so at the, the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, there was the development of this new society changing technology, the, the steam engine. Uh, and physicists at the time wanted to understand how to optimize the performance of these devices. But they were these macroscopically large systems like this uh, picture on the right of the, the first working diesel engine. And so solving the, the Newtonian mechanics, the 10 to the 23 differential equations you'd need to describe uh, the behavior of these macroscopic devices was uh, clearly infeasible. And so they needed to develop a, a new theory, uh, a phenomenological theory to, to treat the performance of such devices. Uh, and so this theory cared only about kind of the average behavior of some of the macroscopic variables, things like heat and work, uh, and developed into, into thermodynamics. So despite kind of having this uh, very device-oriented uh, beginnings, thermodynamics turned out to be a theory with universal application. And even heat engines in particular uh, were found to be a good model for a, a wide range of naturally occurring systems across all length scales, uh, everything from the uh, microscopic uh, molecular motors within biological cells, all the way up to planetary scale systems like hurricanes, even up to cosmological scale objects like black holes. Uh, and furthermore, uh, or heat engines have, have clear practical applications. Uh, so they're the basis for thermodynamic devices. Uh, and in general, if we want to understand how to optimize a device to make uh, best use of the resources available to it, uh, well, understanding how to optimize heat, en heat engines and apply the theories of thermodynamics to such devices uh, is a good avenue to understanding how to make best use of, uh, of those resources. And Currently, we find ourselves in something, a position something similar to those uh, physicists at the, at the turn of the century in the Industrial Revolution, where we're faced with what might be an, another revolution in the form of the quantum revolution, so the development of uh, quantum devices, which are celebrated for their ability to make use of uh, the additional resources available to quantum systems, uh, things like entanglement and coherence to potentially uh, outperform their classical counterparts. And so if we wanna understand how to best optimize these quantum devices, uh, best optimize the res or their use of resources, whether those resources are say energetic or, or informational, uh, then thermodynamics, a theory developed for the, the optimization of devices is, is uniquely suited uh, for this purpose. However, uh, as, as I mentioned, you know, thermodynamics was developed to describe these large scale, the average behavior of these large scale macroscopic systems. Quantum systems being small scale and, and subject to inherent fluctuations uh, present a challenge for how to translate the classical theory of uh, thermodynamics to, to quantum systems. So it makes sense then uh, to follow in kind of the historical path of thermodynamics, given that it was uh, developed uh, from this basis of understanding heat engines. Uh, if we want to understand how to extend thermodynamics to quantum systems, it makes sense to start with uh, understanding quantum heat engines. So now that we have a, a bit of an idea of why we're interested in heat engines, and in particular quantum heat engines, well, why would we consider a uh, engine with uh, graphene as the working medium? Well, so graphene is a uh, two-dimensional material. It's a honeycomb lattice of carbon atoms uh, of a single uh, atomic layer thin. Uh, it was uh, first mechanically isolated in, in 2004. Uh, by Andre Geim and Konstantin Novoslov, uh, for which they received the 2010 uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, so they were able to isolate the, the graphene layers via mechanical exfoliation. 
And uh, I'm pretty sure everyone who's taken an introductory solid state course has, has heard the story of uh, this is really a fancy word for saying they took a chunk of graphite and were able to stick scotch tape to it and peeling off the tape uh, left behind uh, atomically thin layers of graphene on the, uh, on the surface of the tape. And so in, in celebration of the Nobel Prize, uh, Andre Geim actually donated his uh, signed tape, scotch tape dispenser to the Nobel Museum, which is what I have uh, illustrated on the right there. So since then, uh, graphene has been very well studied, both uh, theoretically and experimentally. It's of interest uh, in particular for its uh, electronic properties, uh, such as very high conductivity, uh, both uh, electronic conductivity and also thermal conductivity. Uh, graphene is also what's known as a uh, Dirac material. So the uh, behavior of the charge carriers at low energies uh, can actually be described by the Dirac equation uh, from first quantization relativistic quantum mechanics. So this makes it an ideal system uh, for exploring relativistic quantum behavior at uh, laboratory scale energies. So if we want to understand uh, the thermodynamics of quantum systems, in particular the thermodynamics of relativistic quantum systems, then graphene makes an ideal candidate uh, to serve as our example system. So uh, with the motivations in hand, a bit of an outline of what I'll be talking about uh, over the rest of the talk. Uh, so first I'll give an introduction to multilayer graphene, in particular its energy spectrum uh, from which we can determine the appropriate partition function and then all of the uh, equilibrium thermodynamics. Uh, then I'll discuss uh, the endoreversible auto cycle, uh, an overview of the cycle itself, uh, how we can derive the uh, engine characterizations we're interested in, uh, the, such as the efficiency and the power output, uh, as well as the uh, isentropic relation that's necessary to get these uh, engine characterizations in terms of uh, just our experimentally controllable parameters. Uh, and then I'll uh, give it uh, an overview of the results uh, for the case of a, a multilayer graphene working medium, so namely the efficiency and power output, the parameter regimes where the system functions as an engine versus a refrigerator, uh, as well as the efficiency at maximum power, uh, which is one of the most uh, practically applicable characterizations of uh, engine performance. Uh, so first, uh, a little bit of an introduction to multilayer graphene, uh, particularly the, the multilayer graphene system that we considered here. Uh, so we're looking at uh, what's called ABC stacked graphene. So the honeycomb lattice of graphene can be divided into two triangular sub lattices. And so uh, if we think of a multilayer of graphene where we have uh, several graphene lattices stacked on top of each other, the ABC stacking corresponds to uh, rotating each lattice in the stack uh, with respect to uh, about 60 degrees with respect to one of the carbon atoms in the sub lattices. So uh, that gives us three possible rotations, uh, which correspond to the ABC layers uh, before the uh, uh, we've rotated fully back to the original configuration. Uh, and so we have then uh, stacks that are offset such that uh, each uh, atom in one of the layers has an atom corresponding to uh, one of the other positions in the in the triangular sublattice uh, in the layer above it. So in the presence of an external magnetic field, we get Landau quantization in this system uh, and the energy spectrum uh, is shown here. Uh, so it takes the form where uh, capital N is the uh, total number of layers in the multi-layer system. Uh, lowercase n is the uh, quantum number for the energy excitations. Uh, and omega n is the, the frequency that emerges from the Landau quantization, which is uh, corresponds to the, or is proportional to the external magnetic field uh, raised to the power of the number of levels over two. Uh, so we note that uh, the square root uh, in the energy spectrum here looks very similar to what we see emerge in uh, relativistic quantum mechanics uh, from the Dirac equation where we have the relativistic energy momentum relationship. And to get an idea of how the energy spectrum behaves, I've plotted here uh, the spectrum for the case of uh, monolayer, bilayer, and trilayer systems. Uh, and in particular, uh, an important detail about the, the bilayer system is that uh, we see that we now have a quadratic dependence on the uh, quantum number, uh, which looks very similar to uh, 
essentially a, a non-relativistic harmonic oscillator system versus, say, in the monolayer case, uh, where we have just the uh, linear dependence on the quantum number under the square root, it looks uh, like the uh, ultra-relativistic version of the quantum harmonic oscillator, typically called the Dirac oscillator. Uh, another important distinction about the uh, bilayer spectrum is we actually get an additional term that emerges in the energy spectrum, which can be interpreted as an effective mass. So whereas in the uh, monolayer and trilayer systems, the charge carriers behave as uh, massless relativistic uh, fermions, in the case of the bilayer system, they behave as if they are massive uh, particles. Nathan, just to be clear, if you go back, you have two formulas for EN. I wasn't sure which formula corresponded to which words you were saying. Can you? Can uh, you yes. Yeah. Sure, sure. So, so the, the top uh, formula here for EN, uh, this is for a generic uh, N level uh, multi layer system. Uh, so, we get this form for a single layer, uh, we would just have a dependence on N. Uh, for bilayer, we get n times n plus one. Trilayer would be n, n plus one, n plus two, all the way up to for uh, capital N levels, uh, the, the form shown here. Whereas the. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, the lower one uh, is bilayer. Right. The lower one is specifically just for the bilayer case, yes. Right. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks for pointing that out. A little bit confusing notation there. Uh, an, another important thing to note here is. Uh, the frequency here, uh, that accounts for all of the uh, system dependent parameters and, and physical constants, but it, it will be different depending on the number of uh, levels, the, uh, uh, that uh, frequency. So with the uh, energy spectrum in hand, uh, we're now in a position where we can uh, calculate the uh, canonical partition function. So in order to accurately determine the partition function, one thing we have to keep in mind is what are the degeneracies uh, for the energy levels. Uh, so we have here fourfold, each energy level uh, besides the zero energy state is fourfold degenerate. Uh, so we have a factor of two that arises from the spin degeneracy uh, and a factor of two that arises from what's known as the valley degeneracy, the fact that we can separate the uh, honeycomb lattice into these two triangular uh, sub lattices, two different uh, uh, we can separate the Brillouin zone, essentially. Uh, and then, particularly for the case of the zero energy state, uh, if we look back at the general form of the energy spectrum for the n-level case, uh, we see that it will have uh, an n-fold uh, degeneracy in the uh, zero energy state. Uh, so for example, in the two-level case, we see when uh, lowercase n is zero, uh, we have a zero energy state, or also when it's one, and then so forth as we, as we increase the number of levels. So to keep track of that degeneracy in the expression for the partition function here, I've separated out the, uh, the zero energy states, which are still then that additional fourfold degeneracy from the spin and, and valley degeneracy. Uh, and so we get this overall form for the partition function sum. Now, uh, this summation cannot be carried out into closed form, but if we make the assumption that the uh, number of layers is small in comparison to the number of occupied states, uh, we can rewrite it uh, as an integral, uh, essentially making the approximation of a, of a continuous spectrum. Uh, and this integral can be carried out analytically uh, and gives this uh, following closed form, uh, where I've expressed the partition function in terms of uh, just the temperature, the external magnetic field, and the number of layers, uh, and included all the uh, uh, physical constants and system-specific parameters in this uh, gamma n turn. So with an expression for the partition function, we can take the uh, appropriate derivatives and determine all of our thermodynamic properties of interest. Uh, so here I've shown the uh, internal energy and the entropy for the monolayer, bilayer, and trilayer case uh, respectively. In order to make sure that uh, in the parameter regimes we're exploring here for the engine performance that this uh, integral approximation we've made is appropriate. Uh, I've also shown in uh, solid blue uh, a numerical calculation of the partition function that keeps the first uh, 50,000 terms in the partition function sum. Uh, and we see that we get uh, uh, very close, very similar functional behavior between our uh, analytical approximation and the uh, numerical calculation. 
This is only for electron degrees of freedom, or do you have other degrees of freedom? Yes. So, so this is just for the uh, uh, the electron degrees of freedom. So that's that's a, another important detail to note here is that in our partition function in our energy spectrum we have both the electron and holes corresponding to the uh, positive and negative energy solutions. Uh, here we're just considering the uh, behavior of the the electrons and not the holes. And no phonons either. Uh, no. Yeah. And uh, why is it that you are getting something different in trilayer, where the monolayer is like perfectly accurate, almost? Yeah. So, so that arises from this uh, approximation we've made to uh, convert the partition function sum into this, uh, this integral that we can carry out. We make the assumption that the uh, uh, number of occupied levels, uh, n, lowercase n, is small compared to the total number of layers, big N, uh, so as we increase the number of layers, big N, uh, the uh, approximation we made becomes less and less accurate. So as, if we would go to, to very high uh, capital N, uh, this approximation would, would break down. Okay. Uh, yeah, any, any other questions? What's the unit of this uh, internal energy here? Uh, so here, uh, well, the internal energy, the, the units here, uh, so I think for these calculations, uh, the, uh, they, I think it's arbitrary units we set, uh, or, or natural units. So we set KB and H bar to one. But, but surely it depends on things like the, uh, the, 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 the structure of the graphene though, right? Uh, the graphene. So the, the, the configuration of the, the, the stacking yeah. yes yes so so things like the um so so it, it so the these energy spectrum that we're using we're using uh an approximation or, or a, a calculation of the energy spectrum where we're considering uh nearest neighbor hopping uh within each level of the lattice uh and nearest neighbor hopping uh between different levels of the lattice uh and mm. so these these hopping parameters, uh, those are uh, incorporated into this uh, gamma n uh, term here. All the the, the physical uh, characteristics of the of the lattice structure. But can you give us a scale, a feel of the physical scale? Are you talking about electron volt energies? Yes. Micro yeah, electron volt energy? energies. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Any any other questions? All right. Uh, so with the, uh, the equilibrium thermodynamics in hand, we can now consider uh, how we might implement a, a endoreversible auto cycle uh, for the case of a, of a graphene working medium. Uh, so first, an overview of the, the auto cycle in general. Uh, so it consists of four strokes, uh, isentropic compression, uh, isochoric heating, isentropic expansion, and isochoric cooling. In this case, our external control parameter is the external magnetic field. So the compression stroke corresponds to increasing the external field, and the expansion stroke corresponds to decreasing the external field. So in this sense, the external field plays something akin to the role of an inverse volume uh, for an analogy to a, a classical uh, heat engine cycle. Uh, we're making the assumption that the uh, cycle is operating in an endo-reversible regime. So that means we assume that the working medium is always in a state of local equilibrium with a well-defined temperature, but that during the heating and cooling strokes, it doesn't fully thermalize to the temperature of the hot and cold reservoirs. So this is kind of a first step into finite time behavior beyond uh, quasi-static uh, thermodynamics, where we're assuming everything is still equilibrium behavior but we uh, have these finite time uh, processes during the heating and cooling strokes. So to uh, characterize the engine performance, namely the efficiency and the uh, power output, uh, we can do that in terms, uh, we can find, we need to find the, uh, the heat and work uh, exchange during each stroke of the cycle. Uh, and to do this, we just need to take the uh, differences in internal energy uh, at each corner of the cycle. Uh, and, but what you note there, since we're working in an 
uh, endo-reversible framework, uh, we have four unknown temperatures, essentially, uh, since we don't fully thermalize to the temperature of the uh, hot bath at the end of the heating stroke or to the cold bath at the end of the cooling stroke. Uh, we uh, can't say that our, our internal energy there uh, corresponds to the temperatures of the hot and cold reservoirs. Ultimately, what we want is to determine our uh, engine performance in terms of just experimentally controllable parameters like the initial and final uh, strengths of the external magnetic field uh, and the temperatures of the reservoirs. Uh, so in order to solve for these four unknown temperatures, well, uh, since we're working in a state of local equilibrium uh, for the heating and cooling strokes, we can use uh, Fourier's law of heat conduction to solve for the temperatures at the uh, end of those two strokes and thus eliminate uh, two of our unknown parameters uh, and express them in terms of the, or two of our unknown temperatures and express them in terms of the uh, hot and cold bath temperatures, uh, as well as the uh, experimentally determined thermal conductivity of the uh, working medium and the durations of the heating and cooling strokes. To eliminate the remaining two uh, unknown temperatures, we can use the fact that the uh, during the isentropic strokes, the change in entropy has to be zero. Uh, so if we express uh, the entropy in differential form, uh, instead of equal to zero, we can uh, get a differential equation that relates the uh, magnetic field and the uh, temperatures. Uh, we can then uh, integrate both sides to solve this uh, equation, and we find a simple relation between the initial and final temperatures and the initial and final magnetic field strengths at the, uh, uh, for the isentropic strokes. Uh, and this corresponds to just the uh, ratio of temperatures is equal to the uh, ratio of magnetic fields raised to the uh, number of levels, uh, number of layers uh, over two. Uh, and so we define this uh, ratio of initial to final uh, magnetic field strength as the compression ratio uh, in analogy to uh, the classical auto cycle. So uh, now we're able to express uh, all of our engine characterizations in terms of uh, just our experimentally controllable parameters. Uh, and we're in a place where we can determine the engine uh, efficiency and power output. Uh, so first, uh, we determine our heats and works, plug everything into our efficiency expression, and it simplifies out very nicely. We end up with a very simple relation where the efficiency is just given by 1 minus the compression ratio uh, raised to the uh, number of levels over 2. Uh, and this looks very analogous to the uh, efficiency of the classical auto cycle, uh, which is just given by 1 minus the compression ratio raised to the uh, ratio of heat capacities uh, at constant volume and pressure. Uh, so we have something here that looks uh, uh, very akin to the classical result for the efficiency. However, the power output does not simplify uh, nearly as nicely as the uh, expression for the efficiency. Uh, we end up with a very complicated expression that depends on uh, all of our experimentally controllable uh, parameters and system specific parameters, uh, namely the compression ratio, the initial and final field strengths, uh, the thermal conductivities of the working medium, the durations of the heating and cooling stroke, um, and the temperature of the uh, hot and cold bath, uh, hot and cold baths. Uh, however, we can uh, plot the, the resulting function uh, for both efficiency and, and power. Uh, and we see that uh, for the case of uh, efficiency, uh, as we increase the number of levels, we end up with decreasing efficiency. Uh, whereas the opposite is true in the case of the power output, uh, as we uh, increase the number of levels, we end up with uh, decreasing power output. Uh, and so this kind of makes sense as we, uh, there's an inherent trade-off between efficiency and power output. Uh, for example, if we wanted to maximize, just maximize the efficiency, all we'd have to do is implement the strokes of our cycle quasi-statically. This would minimize dissipation uh, and lead to the maximum possible efficiency. But implementing truly quasi-static strokes requires uh, infinite time uh, and thus leads to uh, vanishing power output. Uh, so uh, more, this leads to our motivation to looking into the efficiency at maximum power as a uh, more practical characterization of our engine performance. Uh, but before getting into that, uh, 
since we have uh, expressions for the heat and work uh, as a function of our, our parameters, we can also explore the whole parameter regime in which the engine uh, might operate, or which of the cycle might operate as an engine versus as a refrigerator. Uh, and so as we might expect from the fact that uh, increasing the number of levels leads to a, a smaller regime in which there is positive work output from the cycle, we see that uh, increasing the number of levels leads to a uh, significantly larger refrigerator regime and a shrinking engine regime, where for the case of the monolayer system, we have a larger parameter space where it operates as an engine versus a refrigerator. But by the time we get to the tri-layer system, we have a significantly larger refrigerator regime than engine regime. So our, our final characterization of our uh, cycle performance is, uh, as I mentioned, the, the efficiency at maximum power. So to determine this, we maximize the power output with respect to our external control parameter, the compression ratio, uh, and then determine the efficiency at that maximum power output. So for the case of the uh, classical auto cycle, the efficiency at maximum power is given by uh, what's known as the kurtzen alborn efficiency, uh, which is one minus the square root of the ratio of the cold bath temperature to the hot bath temperature. Uh, that's plotted here as the solid black line. And we see for the case of both the monolayer, or of all the monolayer, bilayer, and trilayer uh, multilayer systems that the efficiency at maximum power exceeds that of the kurtzen alborn efficiency with the monolayer system having the highest efficiency at maximum power uh, and then decreasing towards the uh, kurtzen alborn efficiency as we increase uh, the number of levels. Uh, and then for comparison, uh, the solid brown line at the top of the plot there is the uh, Carnot efficiency, uh, just to show uh, where in comparison to the maximal possible performance, the efficiency at maximum power lies. So to uh, kind of uh, wrap everything up that I've uh, uh, discussed today, I've talked about uh, using multilayer graphene uh, uh, I've discussed the energy spectrum of multiple layer graphene and how uh, essentially we see it can vary by changing the number of levels from a uh, relativistic Dirac oscillator behavior to uh, non-relativistic uh, quantum harmonic oscillator behavior uh, and beyond for, for higher numbers of levels. Uh, so this makes graphene an ideal system uh, for exploring uh, the thermodynamics of both relativistic and, and non-relativistic quantum systems and tuning between these uh, regimes. Uh, I've shown uh, the performance of an endoreversible uh, auto cycle with multilayer graphene for a monolayer, bilayer, and trilayer case uh, as the working medium. We've seen that increasing the number of layers decreases the uh, power output and the efficiency at maximum power, uh, but does increase the efficiency. We see if the uh, all cases, monolayer, bilayer, and trilayer, that the efficiency of maximum power exceeds the uh, case of a classical auto cycle, uh, in which exceeds the uh, kurtzen alborn efficiency, uh, but decreases uh, as we increase the uh, number of layers uh, converging towards the kurtzen alborn efficiency. Uh, and then finally, uh, as a uh, potential of, for, for future directions and uh, you know, uh, another motivation for, for why these sorts of things are interesting, we're, we're seeing, uh, or, and it has been shown that a variety of quantum working mediums uh, for endoreversible auto cycles lead to efficiencies at maximum power that, that outperform the, the classical case of the kurtzen alborn efficiency. Uh, however, a, an interesting thing to note here is uh, typically we think of uh, the energy spectrum for quantum systems, uh, the important aspect is this discretization of the energy spectrum, where here by taking the integral approximation for the calculation of the partition function, we've assumed essentially a continuous spectrum, and yet we still see performance that exceeds the uh, kurtzen alborn efficiency. And so that brings up the question of uh, what exactly are the features of working mediums uh, that lead to efficiency at maximum power that exceeds the kurtzen alborn efficiency? Is this really a uh, case of a, of a quantum advantage or of, of quantum supremacy and that uh, is there in fact no classical system that can also lead to performance exceeding the kurtzen alborn efficiency or uh, can such a, a classical system be found? Uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, thank my 
uh, co-authors and collaborators that have uh, assisted me with this work. Uh, so Francisco Peña, Patricio Vargas, uh, Natalia Cortez, and Oscar Negrete at the uh, Federico Santa Maria Technical University in Chile. Uh, and uh, thank you for your attention. So maybe one comment to make, Nathan, is that Curzon Alborn is not a universal bound. There are, no. yeah, you, you, yeah, there are other numerous other examples of systems that can violate this bound. Yes. I'm not, yeah, yeah. So, so um, I'm not sure though how you would characterize a classical system because all classical systems have some kind of underlying quantum system that the thermodynamics is emergent from. So what did you mean by a classical system that violates Curzon Alborn? because any kind of yeah. classical system has a partition function realization. Yes, so, so when, I, when I say a uh, classical system that, so, so, so I guess to, to address uh, the, the, the parts of this, this comment individually, yes. So, so uh, Kurtz and Alborn is, is not necessarily a universal bound like say the Carnot efficiency is for, for bare efficiency. Um, it, what's interesting about Kurtz and Alborn is it was originally in Kurtz and Alborn's original derivation. It was for a Carnot cycle, and they found that the uh, efficiency of maximum power was given by this this uh, Kurtz and Alborn efficiency. Uh, and it later, work uh, applied the same endo reversible uh, assumptions to the case of the uh, classical auto cycle with an ideal gas uh, working medium, and found that it also was. Uh, the efficiency of maximum power is given by the Kurtz and Alborn efficiency, which was kind of odd because uh, the Kurtz and Alborn efficiency only depends on the temperatures of the hot and cold baths, uh, whereas for the uh, classical auto efficiency uh, and for quantum auto efficiencies, it depends on the uh, properties of the of the working medium. Uh, however, other cycles have been shown that the efficiency of maximum power is not necessarily given by the Kurtz and Alborn efficiency. Uh, like I think the diesel cycle is not given by Kurtz and Alborn, uh, whereas the Stirling cycle I think is given by Kurtz and Alborn efficiency. So it's not necessarily a universal bound, uh, but the the derivation for the case of the the auto cycle for the for the classical working medium uh, yeah, so so optimizing it with respect to all externally controllable parameters, it's found that it achieves the the Kurtz and Alborn efficiency. But if we compare, say, the case of a uh, classical harmonic oscillator as the working medium to a quantum harmonic oscillator uh, as a, a potential working medium for an endo-reversible auto cycle, we see that uh, whereas in the case of the classical harmonic medium, you get uh, Kurtz and Alborn back for the quantum case, you get efficiencies higher than than Kurtz and Alborn. Uh, and so in this case, essentially, it seems that the difference is uh, the discretization of the energy spectrum, or that that would be a, a uh, clear difference between the classical and the, and the quantum case. Uh, and yet here, this is what, what I think is interesting about this is even if you, uh, in some cases, if you're looking at quantum systems and you make the uh, assumption of the uh, continuous spectrum, you can still see some of uh, you can still see the case where efficiency and maximum power can exceed uh, Kurtz and Alborn. Okay, I'll send you some examples of other systems that can violate Kurtz and Alborn and see if it, if it sure. characterizes to your definition of discrete or or not. So that would be interesting. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And and I guess I guess uh, these examples that you have in mind are they quantum systems or 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 classical working mediums. Uh, well, th that's what I'm trying to understand your definition. Uh, and so some of the examples I have in mind are like mesoscopic systems where you'd have uh, many electrons, but their energies can be treated as quasi continuous. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'd be, I'd be very interested. Uh... Sure, okay. Maybe I'll let somebody else ask a question. Other questions are around. Is that all uh, yeah, why does the efficiency increase with the uh, number of players? Uh, yeah, so go back to our, uh, so yeah, uh, essentially as, as we, uh, as we increase the, the number of levers, so the difference between the, uh, the, the work outputs and the, the heat drawn from the hot reservoir, so, so 
basically mathematically, uh, they, they become more similar. Uh, and so that leads to, to increasing uh, efficiency here. Uh, however, or sorry, sorry, other way around. Um, however, so, so the way I kind of think about it as a physical idea is uh, as we increase, we're, we're getting closer and closer to kind of a, a bulk graphite system as we increase the number of levels. Uh, so we're kind of getting closer to the uh, classical uh, regime. Uh, and the, in this, uh, yeah, getting closer to, to, the, to the classical bounds on, on the uh, thermodynamic behavior of the system. So if you keep increasing the layers, you would approach the Carnot efficiency. That's yes. So if you if you went to a very large number of layers, now we've got to be a little bit careful here because again, our approximation for uh, calculating the uh, analytical form of the partition function, which is where we get these expressions for efficiency and power output, uh, is only valid if the number of, of levels is small. So as we get to a very large number of levels, uh, we have to be careful about uh, these assumptions that we've made. But if we look at the efficiency expression, uh, we see that um, as we increase the number of levels, uh, we essentially uh, yeah, approach the, uh, the, the Carnot uh, efficiency, because remember the compression ratio in our in our endo reversible framework, the compression ratio is related to the uh, ratio of the temperatures at the beginning and ending of the strokes. And uh, conversely, we see as we as we approach the Carnot efficiency and increase the number of levels, the work output vanishes, which is or the power output vanishes, uh, which is what we'd expect because uh, when you hit uh, Carnot efficiency, you end up with uh, a vanishing power output. So, Mason, let me ask you other questions. So, so far you've treated the entire graphene layer as your working medium, kind of like you would an ideal gas in classical thermodynamics. But, but typically when people, experiments are done on these types of uh, single layer graphene sheets, they're done in the context of transport measurements. So typically you would gate these devices, you'd put leads yep. on them, and then you can apply not only electrical bias, but thermal bias. And so sure. I'd be interested if you thought about looking at the thermodynamic uh, properties of these uh, heat engines and fridges in a gated and uh, environment. Yeah, so I, uh... I, that's not something that I've looked into uh, yet, but definitely something I would be interested in exploring. So this, you know, I kind of see this as kind of the first baby step uh, into, you know, uh, looking at uh, the behavior of these heat engine systems and kind of uh, building uh, complexity going from going onward from this. So, you know, all we've considered here is kind of this, um, you know, uh, very close to equilibrium regime. Uh, like you said, we've just treated uh, we're essentially just considering the working medium as the the behavior of the the charge carriers in in the lattice and no other ex, you know uh, factors arising from the from the lattice itself. Um, but uh, yeah, so so building up from here to something more approaching the uh, experimentally realizable uh, uh, framework is is definitely something I'm I'm interested in in exploring. Good. Nicola, yes, so, it's, uh, so in the beginning of your talk, you talked about uh, going into the relativistic uh, thermodynamics. How can we look experimental? Like, how can we look into uh, relativistic thermodynamics using graphene, right? Yeah. But yep. uh, could you comment on how you can see that in your results? Yeah. So, so uh, in the results here, uh, essentially, where the the relativistic aspect might emerge is just in the uh, structure of the energy spectrum from which we derive the partition function uh, and then so forth, the, the uh, thermodynamic behavior. So the, the relativistic aspect of the uh, energy spectrum, particularly for say the, the monolayer case is the fact that we have this uh, 
linear dependence on the uh, quantum number under the under the square root. So this is exactly what would emerge from solving the dynamics for the Dirac equation uh, for the equivalent of a of a harmonic oscillator in a you know in an ultra relativistic regime. Uh, and uh, so by looking at kind of the the uh, thermodynamics that arise from this energy spectrum uh, it gives us some insight into uh, what uh, a relativistic uh, working medium, uh, the thermodynamics of a relativistic uh, uh, system in, in that sense. Uh, in, the sen in the broader sense of say like second quantization, uh, relativistic quantum mechanics, so things like uh, pair creation and annihilation, this doesn't uh, explore any, any of those aspects at all. But uh, as, as I mentioned previously, you know, I kind of see this as, as kind of the first steps of, of probing this uh, relativistic quantum behavior uh, and potentially uh, uh, building up from there, but um, yeah. So so uh, when you know the, the the direction that the the relativistic effects come in is the fact that this energy spectrum is the same as as the one that would arise from uh, the Dirac equation. Yeah, and that's why I think your tra like a transport experiment could be even more interesting because then you just explore the uh, the linear dispersion relation of the quasi relativistic uh, Dirac fermions. And I guess a, a, an important thing to note here is uh, when we talk about the comparison between uh, this, this might be well known for, for uh, everyone in the audience, but uh, the, when we talk about the relativistic parallels between uh, graphene and, and relativistic quantum systems, uh, we have a, a parallel where the, where the speed of light is uh, replaced by the, the Fermi velocity in this case. So it, it looks like you're solving the Dirac equation, but with C replaced by the, the Fermi velocity. Any Zoom questions? If not, yeah, let's thank again Nathan for a very nice talk. Thank you very much.